Hey guys, so unfortunately since uh, it's a pandemic virus outside, we have to carry on these tutoring sessions online. Uh, so you should be reading the group me because I've been continuously posting in there. I haven't heard back from anybody until I individually reached out. Uh, I'm still here. I'm still your SI. Still my job to take care of this. So we are going to try to get through the rest of this class and give you a good understanding of systems fizz from here on out, right? just like we've been doing since the beginning. So part of how I'm going to deliver content to you and help you digest the content will be through this kind of recording medium here. So I have an iPad. You know, I can write on this just like she can in lecture. And I'm going to cover the topics that I think are harder to understand on your own and then put these up as a YouTube video. And you can just watch them at 2x speed or... You know, whenever you're going for a jog or something, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I would do. Uh, so I'll also probably make PowerPoint slides and we'll be having individual Skype sessions and Skype sessions as a group. You know, you just you let me know what you want. Uh, and let me know what you want me to cover. But for now, I think today we're going to talk about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is really cool. It's a protein found here that has four subunits like this. I don't think you really need to know all that. And each one of those subunits, there's a heme molecule shown here. And this heme molecule is an iron surrounded by a whole bunch of shrubbery that binds to oxygen and transports oxygen through the blood, right? Super cool. Now, on this slide, I really want to talk about a very interesting fact of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has differing oxygen affinities depending on its environment. And we're going to talk all about that with this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and all this stuff here. But for now, let's talk about the cooperativity, cooperativity of hemoglobin binding, right? It's got cooperative binding, which is really important. So say this is hemoglobin molecule here. And inside are the heme molecules with the irons. And what we mean by saturation is these iron groups will bind to O2 molecules like this, right? Four of them per hemoglobin molecule, one in each subunit. And this is how we transport oxygen through the tissues, obviously. Hopefully you know that by now. If not, you'll know that by the end of studying this and everything else. But we need a way to transport oxygen that we breathe in to our cells, because oxygen isn't very soluble in the blood, or liquid for that matter, right? So we use this iron to fix oxygen from the lungs and dump them off at the tissues. Now, we're going to get to this graph in a minute, but I want to say something. This is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, right? One very important thing about this curve, it is not linear, right? Right? That means that at this point here, it's increasing faster than this point here, right? So the, way, the rate of change increases and decreases, which is the definition of a curve. You don't need to go crazy. It's just not linear. A linear curve would look like this, straight up, right? Now, you should ask yourself this every time that you're looking at a graph. Why would it be linear? Why is it not linear? You know, those kind of things. And the reason that hemoglobin dissociation is not linear is because of the cooperativity of this binding. Now, let's break that down for a second. Let's erase some of these O2s here. This is a very important concept, guys. So, say this iron binds to an oxygen. It has a certain affinity, right? You know, somewhere on this curve we are right now. Certain affinity depending on the partial pressure of oxygen, right? So, iron binds to the oxygen. Cooperativity of binding states that now this iron next to it is going to have a higher affinity for oxygen than it did before this one bound, right? So, each time oxygen binds to an iron, it increases the affinity for the oxygen to bind to another iron and another molecule of oxygen to the bind to the iron next to it, right? So that's the increasing cooperativity. Cooperativity, yeah, whatever. So 
each time an oxygen binds, it helps oxygen bind to the next iron, right? So that means this oxygen right here helped this guy out, which made it easier, which helped this guy out. So if it was a linear curve, that wouldn't be displayed, that increase in affinity. We could see as we go up, the affinity is increasing, correct? So that's the general idea of, you know, uh, the cooperativity of the binding. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that here. Okay, so this is the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Uh, what do we have on this y-axis here? Take a second, tell yourself. Good job. <laughs> it's like Dora. Where's the ocean? It's right behind you, Dora. O2 saturation of hemoglobin, Hb. What's on the, the x-axis here? Good job. PO2 in millimeters of mercury. Now, I want to give you a general idea of what this PO2 means because I feel like if you really understood that, this would be a lot easier. Now, this is a little bit of an aside, but let's zoom in here. Say I have a jar with some liquid in there, and I have a bunch of sodium chloride molecules. Say this is 10 molar. That means that there's 10 moles per liter of sodium chloride. That's a concentration, right? We do that same thing with gases, but instead of saying molar, we say partial pressure. So if I have a bunch of O2 molecules in here, I'm going to ask myself, what's the concentration of oxygen? I'm not going to say molar. I'm going to say PO2, partial pressure. That's the pressure that oxygen is exerting on the container and in the headspace above it, but don't really worry about that. It's just molar for NaCl, it will be PO2 for oxygen or PCO2 for carbon dioxide or PN2 uh, for nitrogen, right? So it's a way to quantify the concentration of oxygen in a solution, essentially. So that makes sense. So as we increase... Here, on the x-axis, our PO2 is increasing. That means that in our blood, we have more oxygen, right? Concentration is increasing. So PO2 is like the concentration, essentially. So that makes sense. As we increase in concentration, what happens to the chemical reactions? They go faster, right? The enzyme grabs a hold of its substrate faster. So this increase in concentration basically in, makes it easier for oxygen to saturate hemoglobin on this side. And we could easily see that. At really high concentrations, we have a almost 100% here uh, hemoglobin saturation, right? At low concentrations or partial pressures, we have a low saturation of hemoglobin. So the higher the partial pressure, the more saturated the hemoglobin is, right? Make sense? Okay, so now let's talk about why we are in this specific range right here. So this is 40, this is 60. What significance does this region of the graph have for us? Well, this is, 40 is the PO2 in veins, right? And then 100 is essentially the PO2 in the arteries, which makes sense. In the arteries, we're coming from the lungs, highly oxygenated blood. In the veins, we're coming after we dump the oxygen off. So we have a low partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, right? So the reason that we conduct our business in this range Someone tell me. Just kidding. That's what sucks about this. I can't gauge the class. But we like to keep at the tissues on this curve. We like to keep our partial pressures between 40 and 60 right outside of the cells. And why is that? That's because it's easy to modulate or alter the hemoglobin concentration here, right? 
uh, the oxygen saturation, not the hemoglobin concentration. So if we kept everything at 100%, right? What happens if we decrease the uh, oxygen saturation from uh, the PO2 from 100 to 80? Say we decrease the partial pressure of oxygen from 100 to 80. What does that do to our O2 saturation? Essentially nothing. So that means that even if we decreased 20 partial pressures and millimeters of mercury of O2 from 100 to 80, the hemoglobin in this region is still going to be 100% saturated. That means that we didn't release the oxygen from the hemoglobin, even though we decreased this partial pressure of oxygen from 100 to 80. That's not good. We want to release oxygen from the hemoglobin so we can drop, dump off the oxygen at the cells. That's the whole point of this system, right? So we don't want that. We want to be able to have a point to where if we have a small change in partial pressure, we're going to have a big change in hemoglobin oxygen saturation. I hope that makes sense. Digest that for a minute. Notice we go from 60 millimeters of mercury to 40 and we go from i don't know just say 90 percent saturation to 50 i mean that's not accurate numbers that's not the scale but see the drastic change in the saturation level that's good because when we get to the cells we want to dump it off so we want to be on this responsive part of the curve this part of the curve that changes rapidly with small changes in oxygen concentration. So that's where most of the dumping off of O2 and the bringing in of CO2 at the red blood cells, that's where this occurs mostly. This is at the cellular level. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we can just see this graph. This is the oxygen movement in the lungs and the tissues, right? So here we have a capillary. And this is an alveolar cell. So the oxygen comes in from the outside. This is the air. Comes all the way down through your trachea, into your bronchioles, and into your terminal alveolar sacs. And then it gets dissolved into the capillary. But very rapidly, it binds to hemoglobin to make oxyhemoglobin inside of the erythrocyte. Because oxygen is not very soluble. So then that goes and dumps it off, travels through the body, out of the heart, into the tissues. And we could see here that the hemoglobin then dissociates this oxygen and then dumps it off into the cells for the cells to use. Right here, this, this whole region right here happens right here, essentially. We want this to be responsive. We want hemoglobin to say, hey, I'm at a cell that needs oxygen. Let me dump it off instead of you know, holding onto it like a greedy little molecule, right? It wants to dump it off here. So how do we tell hemoglobin to dump off its oxygen? Well, think about what's going on around these cells here. These cells are going to have high H plus concentrations on the outside, right? Why is that? because cells release CO2, right? And CO2 transforms into H2CO3, and then that transforms into HCO3 minus with an H plus. Boom. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I'll probably do a whole separate video on that. But this hydrogen ions here help tell hemoglobin, hey, Dump off this oxygen. I need oxygen because I need more ATP to live, right? I'll make a whole video about this, actually. I just, I just wanted to touch on it right now. But this is the point where we can modify hemoglobin based on the cellular environment. Uh, we're not going to take a short break.